Welcome to Pure Nonfiction, the podcast interviewing documentary filmmakers. I'm Tom Powers, the documentary programmer for the Toronto International Film Festival and artistic director of Doc NYC. On this episode, I talked to Sandy Tan, the director of Shirkers, that's now playing on Netflix. I first got to see the film in January. I talked about it in my preview of the Sundance Film Festival on Pure Nonfiction, episode 63. Here's what I had to say. The second documentary we'll highlight in the world competition is called Shirkers, and it's among the most creative documentaries I've seen at Sundance. The director, Sandy Tan, grew up in Singapore. As a teenager in the 1980s, she had an outsider's sensibility. She was obsessed with punk rock, fanzines, and indie film. She met a middle-aged man from America who taught a film class, became her mentor, and took her on a road trip. Sandy narrates the film. In the summer of 1992, my friends and I shot a road movie on the streets of Singapore that was to become a kind of urban legend. That movie was called Shirkers, a word which means running away, avoiding responsibility, escape. I wrote the script and played the heroine, a 16-year-old killer named S. When they finished shooting the film, her mentor took the reels and never gave them back. 25 years later, Sandy tries to piece together what happened to Shirkers. She is long overdue to be recognized as a special talent. Every bit of this film is mesmerizing. That was my take in January. The film went on to win the Sundance Best Directing Award for World Documentary. In May, Sandy was in New Jersey for the Montclair Film Festival and joined me in my home studio for this interview. I suggest you watch her film Shirkers before listening because our conversation does contain spoilers. Do you need to pause? Okay, let's go ahead. I started by asking Sandy to give her impression of her mentor, friend, and thief of her film, George Cardona. I thought he was completely non-threatening. I mean, that's his whole vibe. He is very tiny. Um, He seems almost like a mythological character from the beginning. You think of him as kind of like, you know, like he's not elfin, I wouldn't say, but some like maybe, you know, um, not Rumpelstiltskin either, but but non-threatening and just the best storyteller I ever met. Um, And it was strange because you, you couldn't quite place him. He... You couldn't place his accent. He's got this strange, unplaceable accent. Maybe I do too. Um, But he had a stranger one. And he was was always dressed in the most, like, blousy-looking shirts. Like, they were loud, um, floral, loose things that were like blouses. And I couldn't tell if he was gay or straight or anything like that. I mean, and it didn't really matter because we were kids. And I, um, so I never saw him as a threat. I could see him as, and he became my best friend because... Of all those things, like he didn't see him. He's a middle-aged man. You're a teenager. Yeah, and and he didn't quite behave like other grown-ups in my sphere. I guess um, in Singapore, growing up, you know, everybody was was completely humorless and just didn't have any time for me. And um, you know, this here was this this guy who was a great storyteller, really interest, interested in films and French films in particular, and was introducing me to this great world of cinema. And was talking my language, basically. And, um, of course, we became best friends in a strange way. Um, But, yeah, so that was my first impression of him, was a non-threatening, strange person who wasn't quite a grown-up. And, therefore, the rules did not apply. We would, you know, drive around for hours and talk and talk about movies and the light and people. And um, it did not seem inappropriate because he didn't seem like a creepy grown-up in the usual way. Um, From the outside now, if I saw that and if I had a kid who was 18 hanging out with a 40-year-old guy, I would be like, (gasps) but um, back then, I just thought the rules didn't apply to me because I spent so much of my teenage years making my own rules. And you uh, you describe in the film that you were conscious that it probably looked a little weird, uh, but nothing weird was taking place. 
Yeah, I mean, nothing weird was taking place、um, in the conventional way. I guess it was just very strange to be,、um, you know, for this man who had a wife and a young baby、um, to want to be driving around with teenage girls、um, like till like one in the morning and just be talking and sitting in the driveways. Well, actually, you know, he and I would just sit in our driveway and just talk about stuff、um, till like one a.m. Like maybe three. Times a week, and it just looked. I knew it looked weird, and I knew my family just thought it was strange. But、um, I just thought we were beyond that kind of convention. <laughs> so you make a film together with George and、uh, and your other friends, and he is supposed to edit it. You go off to school abroad. He's supposed to be staying back in Singapore and editing it, and it never happens.、Uh, How long did it take before you realized that this was never going to come together? Um, it was it was a kind of a long process, a dragged out process because Jasmine at that point, my friend Jasmine, she was um, um, she thought she was going to be the editor. Of course, she was like a you know nineteen year old kid at NYU, um, who you know was interning at this post house in Singapore for the summer, and she thought she could just go back and edit this film. Late at night when nobody was at work and she could just get this done for free,、um, and but George somehow didn't want to, you know, let her do it. I guess or he just like never would answer our calls and he would just vanish. And、um, you know, it was it was a, it was a long process because if you remember, this is like before the internet. You couldn't quite、um, you know write to him and hassle in the same way.、Um, you couldn't call him. It was really expensive. And also, like we were just, we felt like we had already done something that was transgressive, which was making a film,、um, you know, against the wishes, and you know, and secretly, you know, like I put my money into it, and none of my family knew. So it was kind of an embarrassment to have a further, like this, be a further disaster for it to be taken away from us.、Um, so I kept it really quiet.、Hmm. And it was the three of us by that point, me, Jasmine, and Sophie. We had、um, George had. Played enough mind games on us and kind of played us off each other that we were no longer a unit, and we were living in three different cities. Me, Jas, me, I was in England.、Um, Jasmine was in New York.、Uh, Sophie was in L.A. And it was really hard for us to kind of be a unified force、hmm. to fight this this one demonic、um, film thief, and、um, we we just could not unify and and just pursue this together. So that was you know slow. I mean, it was the slow disintegration and realized、uh, realization that.、Um, That this was never going to happen, and it was, it was a lot of,、um, it was all to do, you know, not just the technical stealing of it. It was a lot of it was just like teenage girl,、um, you know, jealousies, animosities, and and whatnot that kind of you know played into、out. it. Yeah, played into us.、Uh, so I'm curious to understand like what that did to your creative trajectory. I mean, th- there's an alternate universe in this film where. This film could have come out when you were in your early twenties, and you and your friends could have really been recognized in some way、uh, for having accomplished something unique and special. Instead, that didn't happen, and、uh, and you had to live knowing that this thing existed but didn't exist. Yeah, I knew we had accomplished something quite unique with. Um, you know the kind of characters we had in it, like the way it looked and the production design, and it was it was really、um, horrifyingly heartbreaking for it to you know for me to not be able to share it with the world and feel like a crazy person talking about this thing that didn't exist.、Um, so for a long time that was really terrible, but、um, I now tell myself this comforting lie.、Um, I guess you have to. Just tell yourself these lies,、um, and I think it might be actually true too, which is that、um, you know, had we finished this film in 1992 as young women,、um, you know, and tried to put this out in the, you know, in the milieu Singapore in 1992, 1993, they were not ex- excessively friendly to young people trying to make films on their、mm. own,、um, especially films of this kind, like art films that you know were kind of offbeat, and we would have been. You know, mercilessly laughed out of town by the newspapers, like my colleagues or you know, people who weren't,、um, you know, people who are artistically 
frustrate in themselves and would be slightly jealous of young people doing this on their own and just doing this. And I think they would have been so nasty to us. Um, our families would have been merciless in mocking us and our friends too, that we would have all just gave, you know, we would all be like, running for the hills of law school we would be lawyers and accountants we would be we would be doctors i think i think we might have just given up on filmmaking and dreaming i mean a big mystery wrapped up in here is that for george cardona not completing this film he was stifling his own ability to move forward creatively i mean he had something pretty special in his hands that he was nominally the director of do you have any insight into that psychology I think he's a very talented guy. I mean, he's a great storyteller, but he could never finish anything. I mean, he's not, he's a great storyteller. That was his best creative gift, but he could never kind of put it down on paper. He could never capture it. He could never finish. He's never, to my knowledge, has never kind of done anything or finished anything off his own. Um, So he was this great kind of vampire figure where he would prey on these young people with like, I guess some kind of talent were making things and his way of creating was destroying and and taking their voices away from them and you know just not letting them complete their projects because we were you know just one I mean we were the, like the most drastic um vic- I would ha- I hate to say the word victims but we were the worst you know like I guess um I don't know we we, we received the worst um uh, Anyway, uh, he 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 did this to other people too, and and um, so it's, it's it's part of a chain of of things that he did, and um, I think he's incredibly talented. He just um, he just didn't know where to go with it. I mm-hmm. guess mm-hmm. I can imagine someone looking at this story and and wondering why, if you were able to create this script and create this film when you were nineteen, why couldn't you have just done it again when you were? 25 because um because the situation was so unique then at that point like the the fighting that happened on Shirkers was that you know George and I just wanted with the the situation was ideal we knew we couldn't wait everybody was in town that summer we had um everybody ready to go um even if the production was wasn't going to be perfect we were ready to go and Jasmine and Sophie just thought we should wait another year and make everything perfect and ideal and you know you you just cannot wait um to make a film and so we we went ahead and did shirkers and um you know i think um the the ideal situation after this disaster of you know the film theft and all friendships falling apart was that nobody i lost my tribe I mean, we could not come together again as... And a, you couldn't recreate that I, somewhere else. Yeah, and I could not recreate that somewhere else. And this was before the internet. I couldn't find this, the right people. By, by the time I was 25, I had moved to New York. I was um, at film school at Columbia. And, you know, these were people trying to make short films. And I just, you know, it was, it was not the right group anymore. Um, they didn't have the right interests. They didn't have the same kind of ambition I think, I mean, they thought like it was strange to go backwards in a strange way to have made the film and then have become a film critic and then gone to film school at the end. Um, and I feel like I've, I, I I was doing everything backwards because now I was at film school, which is like where everybody felt like they were beginners. And I felt like I w- had already done a lot of these things. Uh-huh. And and it, it was like I just couldn't 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 reconstitute a magical tribe again. So many years go by and then you get a call from George's widow um, saying that she has these cans of film that I guess you had assumed were lost or had forgotten about. Yes. I guess you forgot, probably not forgotten about, but um, w- when you got that call, where was your mindset about Shirkers? Had you put it behind you? I had long put it behind me. Um, I had moved to L.A., I was um, a novelist. My my, I guess my um, book was about to be. I had this novel called The Black Isle that was going to be published by Hachette um, the following year, I guess, twenty twelve, and in late um, twenty eleven, actually September eleventh, twenty eleven. So that was t- the ten year anniversary of September eleventh, and I get this strange email out of the blue from from this the widow, and she, um, I guess it was some, she wanted to seek some kind of closure, I guess, on this anniversary, and she wrote to me and said she, George had died, and that she was clearing out his apartment, and had found these reels, um, labeled shirkers, and there were 70 cans of them, 
Um, and was I interested in having them back? And of course I was, but it was such a double-edged sword to have this thing, this ghost, return to your life. And um, I had this other life I was, you know, um, starting, like, as a novelist and, you know, as somebody else. Um, and this thing shows up and, of course, I began corresponding with her and she began sending me these boxes and every few weeks this giant box, this, like, a giant boxes would appear with uh, filled with the reels as, as well as, like, scripts. Every shred of little bits of paper, like camera logs, um, you know, slides, everything, um, like videotapes. Um, and, you know, they would stack up in my house. Um, and by the end, it's like I had like five or six Pandora boxes. Um, do I want to open them up and, and see what lay in them? It was it was a terrifying proposition for me. But in the end, I had to. And that's not an easy process to take cans of 16 millimeter film and see what's on them. So it took three years before I, I I I summoned the courage to open up the first box that was sitting in my living room for three years and um and then I, I opened up the cans and each one of them um there were seventy of them and every reel of film was wrapped up in black um trash bag like plastic. So everything was pristinely preserved. I mean this guy George, he had been lugging these boxes across the world with him because he had lived in many different cities uh, before he died and um you know and they were in pristine con condition and that was i mean i, I if nothing else he was a great archivist he was a great archivist um he was a pack rat i guess he harbored some kind of i don't know if he thought he would ever finish the film but he just thought he would preserve it um for whatever reason um, you know, even as like just artifacts that he stole from us because part of his thrill, I guess, and what part of his his gift and his narrative um, was to steal things from people. Um, and, and so he kept this all in perfect condition. And when I took these things to the lab, I've, I, nobody knows what to do with 16 and it's incredibly expensive now. So I, I, I went looking around and I asked around for who could deal with this and who knew about color because color was so important. Um, so I found this place called um, Modern Video Film, I guess, um, which is in Burbank, California, which does a lot of the Criterion discs. Mm -hmm. And um, they worked on the Douglas Cirque movies, which, you know, the palettes, the colors, I understood. And also on the, the Grand Budapest Hotel. And in fact, I, I found the, the same colorist who had worked on the Douglas Cirque to work on my film. Um, in the dailies anyway. And when, when we did the transfer to 2K at that place, the colorist was sitting next to me and he was just like in awe. His jaw dropped and he was like, wow, oh my God. And he thought it was a hoax at first. Like, there's no way this was shot, you know, 23 years ago, 22 years ago. And um, in this condition and they look, you know, the, the footage looks insane. Like, you, what? You were kids doing this? And where? And when? With what money? Nothing. And um, so he was, he was just like, that was when I, I realized, oh, he really had something, mm. you know, and I realized the stranger had nothing to do with this film and no, no idea who George was or wh where Singapore was, um, but was just looking at it as footage, like just, you know, and was thinking that's something amazing and I have to do something with it. Now, when you set out to make your documentary Shirkers, you're in a very different place than when you're making your uh, first film. And I often think that a that a real asset to a first time filmmaker is naivete. You know, you don't know the obstacles that lie ahead. You're full of confidence. And for someone later in life, you don't you've lost that uh, in a sense. You're married to a film critic, John Powers. You're constantly processing films, uh, I have to imagine. And that can also be inhibiting for thinking about your own creative work was it was that the case for you do, do you feel like it, it was a bigger challenge making this film without naivete um i was still pretty naive i guess in a good way i guess um because what happened was for the longest time i resisted making this a personal doc i just didn't want to see myself on screen i didn't want to hear myself on screen and but what i was working with the great editor um inat cd um who worked on the Wolf Pack and works often with Heidi Ewing and Rachel Grady. Um, and she, you know, she was she was working on the the uh, development reel with me and she came to my house and saw my archive of letters and 
and scripts and all these photos from my youth as a teenager. And she said, Sandy, you have to look at your archive. It is, has, has to be about you. Sandy, you have to make a video diary. It is about you. And she's Israeli. I can't do her accent. Um, <laughs> but she was like so insistent. It was about me and I was resisting it for a long time. Um, so what happened was I knew to, to make this film, I had to kind of embrace and, and recreate the kind of um, emotional um, frenzy I felt as a teenager and just, you know, it was going to be an, an emotional journey. It's going to be a journey um, that begins with instinct and then, um, you know, you find structure and story in it. But you first had to recapture what it felt like to be this crazy teenager the, the way I was um, back then. So I began digging to my archives and I began like reliving what it felt like to be that person and um, to be crazy about films and to feel fearless and to feel free, basically. And and it helped that I did not was not working with a conventional like grown up editor. I was basically me and my um, editor, Lucas Seller, who actually has had no editing credits to his his, you know, um, he's a younger and editor. He's he's a young editor who was a skateboarder and and a barista and was just fully game, like just a, <laughs> a Photoshop king. Um, and we just you know, and so we approached this with just like just free, just you know, just 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 gung ho, and 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 really with the frenzy of um, a zine, um, you know, collagist that I was when as a teenager, just movie mat, completely emotional. Um, and just full of instinct and we went for it and as I went along I realized I discovered I guess the story and the structure and then it all came together as this giant jigsaw puzzle and um, the shape just took form in a very um, I, th I think you know as a documentary filmmaker you have to treat the material as living they're, they're living things they're organic and and so you have to be extremely flexible and and be able to, to just kind of like weather and just like you know skate on these things with these things and just dance with them and i think um that's what we did this team of people who 25 years ago had uh, come together to uh, make this thing now came together again when you showed the film for the first time at sundance you jasmine sophie were together again for the first time in a long time what was that experience like um you know when it, the original Shirkers was me um, kind of, you know, I keep saying it's like the character of S, which is played by me, um, you know, going around the small little island of Singapore, searching for her tribe and then killing them. Um, and then the, the new, um, the, the large Shirkers, this Shirkers, the documentary um, that I just made is kind of like the um, remake of a movie that was never made. And it was it's, it's a larger scale version of me going around the world, finding all these characters, refinding these characters that had been involved in, in the original production, as well as finding new collaborators to make this film with around the world. And and then just assembling this this team and kind of bringing everybody back to life again. So my I found my, my, my composer lived in Israel and we worked via Skype. I mean, this Your is composer hard. from over 25 years no, ago. No, no, no. Oh. My composer of this, this current version. I'm so sorry. It's okay. so confusing. Um, but... I found him. Um, I found him on the internet, and and so my new collaborators, um, like you know, like was they had to to kind of work alongside my old collaborators with the materials that you know the interviews that my old collaborators um, gave to me, and we all met up in Sanans for the first time um, in January, 2018, and it was kind of amazing because none of these people had ever met each other, and I had not met some of them before, but everybody had this instant con connection, and it was completely. Um, you know, it's the emotional instant bond of being a tribe of shirkers, I guess. Before you made this film, you had set yourself on a course of being a novelist. Now you've made uh, this film. Where do you see yourself going now? Um, I've always wanted, I mean, I've always, filmmaking was my first love. Um, I made actually, you know, I made short films that that before I became a novelist um, that played at the New York Film Festival and things like that. Um, and so I, you know, there was this, this huge gap, this, 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 I don't know, this, this hole in my life, I guess. And um, now I guess I've proven to the world maybe um, that I can, I can maybe fill in that hole and, and just, you know, I, I'm actually so, so busy with projects I'm developing right now um, in both fiction and nonfiction. I just am so impatient to make up for lost time and to get back into the, you know, the whole filmmaking thing. I just feel more alive. I mean, there's, you know, as a novelist, you, you, you're just basically, um, 
your life in a different way. You're completely in control. It's extremely isolating. And as a filmmaker, you suddenly feel that you're amongst kin again. I mean, it's also extremely lonesome, of course, when you're writing and editing. But there is this kind of a living thing you're dealing with where it's not just you. Mm. And I kind of live for that. So I'm looking forward to working on many more projects. I want to thank Sandy Tan for talking to me. Her film Shirkers is now playing on Netflix. Before we wrap up, I have one more bit of Singapore film trivia. In Shirkers, Sandy uses a clip from the 1970s Singapore action film, They Call Her Cleopatra Wong. The film star went by the screen name Marie Lee, reportedly because it sounded like Bruce Lee. The actress has a connection to Sandy. Um, she was this great influence in my life, I guess, when I was uh, about eight, when she was um, with my father for a short period. I mean, it was a short, intense period. She remains my favorite stepmother. Um, <laughs> Um, and I hate to say that on the air, um, but it's true. And she's she's really cool because she 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 was completely over by the time she was nineteen, and she was with my father when she was young, like she was a you know nineteen or twenty, and I was a kid. And um, you know, and of course, like she being a young person, she um, was a great storyteller. Hmm. And I hadn't known that she had this great past where she made these action films in the. Philippines. So that had already happened. Before. It ha- already happened. She was finished by the time she was. 20 she she made Cleopatra Wong when she was like um she was cast and 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 did the role I guess, I guess when she was 18 so there's a lot of parallels with me and Shirkers um and and um you know she she went and that was her first film and she made a series of films um there was Cleopatra Wong and then there was Dynamite Johnson where she re- reprised the same role but in a you know secondary part um to a bionic boy and you know and, and there was a whole series of like kind of action films where she was um, kind of a, the first action female star from that part of the world, really. Mm. And some say, because um, Quentin Tarantino said this to her, that she was kind of the inspiration, one of the inspirations for um, Kill Bill, wow. Uma, Uma Thurman's character in Kill Bill. And for years, he had a portrait of her um, hanging in his kitchen, and he kind of was obsessed with her for a while. She's she, in Late in life, she's now become an auteur. She's made two films. She wrote and directed two action films. I mean, really not my kind of films. And I was too busy to kind of help her along. And But I really admire her that she just like sold her house and bought wow. equipment. And, Where is she based? Um, in Singapore. And okay. she got this bunch of like suburban, um, you know, older people who didn't know much about films and banded together, bought some red cameras, um, you know, this giant ass um photocopying machines so they could do script like photocopy scripts and like she just went out and learned you know just by watching videos i guess on youtube and they made two feature films i mean i'm, I'm completely not in awe of her because she's fearless she did her own stunts on cleopatra wong and it's a cult movie you it's should amazing. look up yeah you, you just like look, go on youtube there's like i hate to say this but go on youtube and it's it's there for free to look at they call her cleopatra wong i think she's kind of a forgotten um, superstar that needs to be recognized. There is only one person in the world who knows where to phone me at this time of night, and that's Cleopatra Wong. What did I do to deserve all this? That's our show. Thanks to our team, series producer Sarah Modo, sound recordist Eric Spink, sound mixer Tom Micah, and web designer Cross Strategy. Our theme music is composed by Andre Williams, and our executive producer is Rafaela Nehausen. I'm Tom Powers. You can follow me on Twitter at THOM Powers. If you love nonfiction films, look out for America's largest documentary festival, Doc NYC. If you're a professional filmmaker or looking to become one, check out the Doc NYC Pro Conference. Both festival and conference last eight days from November 8th to 15th. For more information, go to docnyc.net. Pure Nonfiction is distributed by the TIFF Podcast Network. You can read our show notes, learn about live events, 
and sign up for our newsletter at purenonfiction.net. Thank you.